so much of gravitas and respect to this occasion and from the entire startup ecosystem all our love and support for the courage encouragement that you've given us all through this time so thank you so very much for being with us here today i would now like to invite the founder and ceo of your story to invite ma'am as well ma'am please if you could address us with a keynote and then we will have a fireside chat Good afternoon. I'm just taking a bit of a time. First, of course, to absorb the energy in this room. It's so overwhelming, and it's all over. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, Shraddha, and your team. I always go back energized. when i come and interact with the startups the groups which you engage very much in conversation and so on so once again a pleasure to be here but apologies for reaching late straight from the airport didn't go to uh, the room didn't even uh, wait for a cup of tea i didn't require it let me be honest Thirteenth edition of Text Park. I must congratulate the Your Story team. Starting it much before 2014, it wouldn't have been easy. I say this because 2014 and afterwards, you had at least a government, a prime minister, a couple of ministers, all of whom were always ready to get your bashing. saying nothing is happening you didn't do anything you should do this you should do that which is fine that kind of an engagement is always useful but prior to 14 and i'm not talking politics here prior to 14 when the ecosystem was revving to do something for itself to have somebody like shraddha sit in toil to form some group and to make sure that that is going to be a catalyst in having the government engage with the startups or to continuously have conversation with startups and bring investors together wouldn't have been easy at all and the fact that at that time gradually because it took some time for the global financial crisis to impact on india and you were leading towards a fragile fi economy so the economy and the concerns of the economy were on a different platter altogether so engaging with investors or multinationals and giving that necessary conversational platform for startups at that time would have had different priorities so post 2014 when the government and prime minister himself has constantly been engaging with you all it's a different story but therefore all appreciations for your story which has kept itself on the roll since when it formed and today having the 13th edition of the text park is not a mean achievement so congratulations So since 2014, about which I can speak, and since 2014 to today, we have seen so many different changes happening world over, and indeed in the last few years, the changes have been of an order and scope which none of us would have imagined. Whether it is the pandemic or whether the uh, global inflations which are happening different countries facing different levels of inflation 
in some countries not seen for decades. And before the inflation, what was being commented upon was interest rates are very low and they've remained low for a long time. Now interest rate issue is on a different platter, but inflation is high and going to be high for a long time. So low interest earlier, high inflation now. So we are seeing different kinds of newer problems. And I'm not yet referring to the Russia-Ukraine matter, which has created a lot of food insecurity, energy insecurity, logistics problem, and a situation where it's no longer affecting only the nearer geographical jurisdictions. It's affecting everything anywhere in any part of the world. Value chains are disrupted. Logistics is disrupted. Food chains are not working any longer. Even further, fertilizer transportation is becoming an issue. So you're really not sure. Economies which have great agricultural base and which require this constant good supply of fertilizers are sitting and watching, saying we can produce more if only we have uninterrupted supply of fertilizers. So uh, the reason why I'm putting all this across into as though I'm putting into a dump, into a basket full of everything throw into it, is to tell you how complex, how unexpected, how in its scope intense each one of these issues are. If this is the development in the last few years, and this is what we have to now look up to handling, look up to handling them, look up to facing the challenge, and making sure that India, having moved from that fragile five in 2013-14 to the fifth largest economy today, and which is revving to want to reach the third position at the earliest, and with our Honorable Prime Minister having very clearly told us the next 25 years we will have to reach India, developed India by 2047, I'm speaking before you with a great sense of hope. And why do I say that? Not because the economy has somehow reached that position, but I'm looking at an India where half the population is less than 25 years, where between the ages of 20 to 40, you have about 700 million people. And the large layer of population is aspirational. They have money, they have only such money which they can absolutely value. They're not high net worth individuals, but who also have the purchasing power who by now have seen how the world has organized itself in different parts of the world. Different countries have organized themselves in different parts of the world. And therefore know that India can also organize itself with a citizen-centric mind and making sure that citizen-centric reorganization of the society would mean better civic facilities, better networking facilities, better fundamental infrastructure, better health care, better education, better skill. Now, if that has got to be achieved for the less than 25 today, the solutions will have to also come from you. And why do I say that? There's no more patience for creating bridges. Like, for instance, I build, a, a, let us say, a flyover in a city like the old-fashioned way we would give the tender and then say, put a board there saying, contract has been given to so-and-so, it is going to take time to finish 2030. We are being honest about saying it's going to take 2030. In the meanwhile, three times cost escalations happen, and you know how that system has left India. But today, in-situ solutions are the ones which are going to happen, and for which technology-driven innovators 
are the ones who we need. Technology-driven innovators who are going to look at local solutions. And local solutions which can have a, or have two features. One, affordable solutions. And two, scaling up probabilities. Unless your solutions are going to be scalable, and unless your solutions are going to be cost effective, that typical thing about India innovation is not going to be there. And unless that feature is maintained in being cost effective and also in being sure that it can be scaled up, we really cannot achieve as much as we aspire for. I don't know if I'm wrong in quoting this example. There was a time when uh, Mangalyan, we were 99.9% .9 successful. It was going to land, and all of us kept watching it. But never mind, I'm sure we are coming up again with it. Costed us far lesser than, I was told, making of Slumdog Millionaire. So Mangalyan could cost far lesser than a, Bolly, a Hollywood film speaks millions about what India's innovation capabilities are. Frugality in innovation. Frontier technologies don't frighten us in terms of cost. In terms of knowledge, it doesn't ever frighten us. So frugality of innovation, scalability. So in situ solutions should also be scalable. And that is where today in your tech spark, I'd like to remind that Honorable Prime Minister and also many of us already have st spoken about it, that this coming decade is going to be a decade. Technology is what is going to drive us. And, and in technology, it's not just going to be looking at some fundamental things which you're going to change, but you're going to be able to do some things using several of those which are yet not available for many of the parts of the world. Digital skeletal network which is available in India is not available elsewhere. Digital fundamental infrastructure and in that, even without waiting to build up a case, in India, digital fundamental infrastructure is created with government and created for it to be a public good rather than cost it. And when I say public good, it's available for you, it's available for me, it's available for anyone who wants to use it, and it is the cost is borne by the government for the fundamental bare skeletal structure over which the private or the public or the joint public private partnership can all lay their own superstructures. That kind of government coming out and creating a public good, a digital public good, with a futuristic approach that each one of you all can do your own sandbox exercises. Try it. And the regulators are willing to have that sandbox exercise scaled up. This is not available in many of the countries. And therefore, when we say decade, decade we are not talking off the cuff. We are not talking without substance and continuously ramping up that fundamental public good in the form of a digital foundation. If I have to put it simply, it is actually the foundation which is one billion identity, one billion mobile connectivity, and one billion of financial inclusion all of which has given the first three, you know, 
basis or the lintels on which you have the basis on which other things have got built up. So whether it is the India stack or whether it is the open uh, network for digital commerce or the OSEN as you would call it, these are all getting built up on the top. And it is getting built up because we know there is r ramping up capacity and immediate application requirements. So that is why the digital application which started off now has extended itself into digital commerce, into education, into banking, into healthcare, into insurance, into currency. So the rapidity with which each one of you all are looking at how to exploit that common public good is making India absolutely nimble in the digital world. We are becoming so nimble that we know, here is an opportunity, I can work on it, and I can show you a product. And that is where, like for instance, today, I've come late all right, but otherwise it was going to be two hours and 45 minutes of spending with the startups, spending with a separate indoor, which I don't know with what intention, um, Shraddha's thought that I should be kept inside a room with investors, multinationals, about 14 unicorns, and about uh, probably three or four sunicorns, and <laughs> decacorns. I was just thinking probably today there should be a appendix to our lexicons with only the startup language in it. <laughs> and many of our friends who are observers of Indian economy are now catching up with these, you know, new terminology which is coming in and there might be a time when uh, we will be told, hey, stop all these jargons get talking to normal language, which you probably, keying as you are, Vasili, would say, these are jaded old time dinosaurs, world is different, it's our world now, our language now, our terminology now, and so on. So that's the spirit of India today with the startups setting forth the agenda. You're setting forth not just the innovation agenda for a knowledge-based India, which can service the whole world. If manufacturing industries will have to grow, they will have to grow over the basis that they've created for themselves over a couple of generations. Whereas you are setting the base, setting the language, the terminology, and also setting the future course. So I literally would want to say, I N V U. I N V U. What a generation. You're setting the terminology. You're setting what has to be done for the future 25 years. You're making people speak that you're the persons who are carrying technology forward for India, so this decade is going to be determined by you. Fantastic. So in a way, prior to 1947, if there were, let us say, two decades of youngsters who were all saying, we are fighting for India, we'll get the independence. And they were the your freedom fighters. Today I see a your economic freedom fighters in you. Because you are the ones who are going to get that, you are the ones who are going to get that economic muscle, prowess, that actual engine of power that India is now not moving on steam engines, no more locomotives. You're bringing an aerospace engine into India's economy so that it can just take off with that kind of a speed. So, 
thank you for that energy, thank you for that kind of a spirit, and thank you for taking forward the dreams of a million Indians. So that's what we are addressing now. And if we are going to address that, what are the ways in which we have to take it forward? This engagement today, I can see, is going to trigger off, for me at least, a lot of inputs, which is going to help us to see how best India can open up. All right, you've already become the third largest ecosystem for startups, Mana. I've, I've taken cognizance of it. I've also taken cognizance of the fact that you're probably the second largest or probably third largest, I'll put it safely, in the number of unicorns. 77,000 startups and more than 105, 107 unicorns. It's not a mean achievement given the fact that it has happened only during the last two years. And it's not a mean achievement at all given the fact that it has happened during the COVID years. Again, on the fact, the two facts which are very critical for India's startups. Your innovation has to be cost effective, which you are by nature, and that it has to be scaled up. One other example which I put before you, inherently India is a cost conscious country. Rota virus costed $60 in the US, whereas what we did it for is just $1. Rota virus vaccine. So it, these are things which have gone into the sciences, into the labs, into the kind of you know, disruptions which are happening in engineering colleges, whether it is in tier two, whether it is in tier three and so on. Inherently, you're cost conscious. And the government from its side is making sure money is not going to be a matter of concern. The science and technology departments, all of them, DBT, DST, C, uh, the Center for Molecular and Biology, all of them are today very seized that the research funds that they have will also have to be helped out for startups who need that kind of support. So money from the government side is now getting aggregated repeatedly every year so that it benefits those who are waiting to be supported, benefits those startups which are waiting to be supported. So I would think that this is the time when startups in India whilst equally worrying about sources of financing, looking at who is going to be able to get you that platform which can bring you all together. We'll also have to look out for areas where you have to spread. I've periodically engaged with the FinTech-related startups. But I've also desired that I get opportunity to interact with those startups which are in other areas of activities. I had come to Raichur University recently to make sure that we are able to throw a challenge and invite startups to come and take up the challenge, give solutions for promotion of millets in India. Because next year is going to be the International Year of Millets as declared by the UN. And sitting as we are in Bengaluru, in Karnataka, Karnataka has a very big area, cultivating millets, value addition, marketing, packaging, all of them need solutions. So in a way, not just FinTech, where you have immensely contributed and are continuing to contribute, not just in solutions where aggregations would bring in cost-effective uh, answers, but also into newer areas of the way in which we run our businesses, shop flow management for the huge marketing uh, manufacturing companies, logistics. India is still looking at 
opportunities for bettering its transportation. The time that a product leaving the factory gate takes to reach the seaport from where it has to find its market outside. Unbelievable time is spent, which is not economical at all. Even there we need solutions, not just the roads, not just the fly flyovers, but how do we cut that with efficient management? E efficient, you know, sp spoken wheel kind of an approach. It's come here, but then how is it going there? Where is it getting locked in? These are areas which will immediately have take us to scale it up. And that's where many of your startup interests have waited for a logistics policy, a startup policy which was announced earlier, kept ramped up. But logistics is an area in which I'd like to see all. So India's multimodal approach to logistics cannot serve its purpose if startups are not looking that side. You are the ones to give solution. In, similar would be the situation of storage and preservation. Not just by telling me a thermostat which will take care of management of the te temperature, but many more things. The materials, materials which are so required for advanced chemistry are also required for basic storage of, let's say, perishable goods, different types of perishable goods, some in which the moisture will have to be retained, some in which the moisture should not be retained. There are so many different things. I don't need to give you ideas, but as much as we find interest in the low orbit satellites, as much we find interest in making sure that the financial transactions globally, where country to country there is interoperable system, where systems talk to each other so that cross-border funding can be effectively carried out without too much of a leveraging on the costs of transfer. There are so many different areas in which India needs innovation. We have, of course, tried to make sure that the IPR system is made easy, is made friendly. Registrations, getting the certification, cost of filing for a patent are all being addressed. In fact, you would know that, you'll be very happy to know in the last five, six years, a 46% increase has happened in patent sanctioning. That's going to make a big difference to you. Women patent applicants are being extraordinarily given support. The cost for startups for registering for a patent has been brought down drastically. I hope you're all aware and you're taking benefits of these kind of schemes which governments have brought in. Both the center and subsequently some of the state governments have also brought in these. Yesterday, for instance, when I was engaging with the US Treasury Secretary, Janet Ellen, the Secretary of Economic Affairs in my ministry gave a presentation on how India's digital prowess is serving financial inclusion and inclusion in general. And that presentation covered all aspects, not just uh, opening of Jandan account and the DBT transfers and how that has actually made a difference to Government of India in terms of plugging the loopholes. The presentation spoke about COVID. The, pre the presentation also spoke about how the national uh, NCPI payment portals are all working and how today sooner you're going to have Singapore and UAE also benefiting from it and Indians living there benefiting from it. So that presentation was, and I'm using this word, not the Treasury Secretary, but it was an eye-opener for them. They were simply surprised that India could do with digital tools and do it at a scale for India 
whether it is COVID where vaccination related information was all available in your handheld instrument of phone and whether the DBT came off handy to reach that last individual, the poorest of the poor, could receive directly from Delhi with the Prime Minister pressing a button, his account had the money. And if, in case he was no, uh, not in a position to reach the bank to draw that money, human intervention comes at the last mile, a bank mitra would go to his house and deliver the cash. And entries were made there itself. And these kind of things were all explained. And the fact that one nation, one ration card has actually helped the migrant, whether he is in Ludhiana or in Mumbai or in Bengaluru, and his family is left behind in some village in India. Both can draw ration from that one digital identity which he possesses. He can draw a portion of the ration and the rest of it can be drawn by the family is digitally enabled fantastic tool with the inclusion principle. All this was explained. All this was explained, and I'm not reading their mind, seated next to me at the lunch table. Secretary did say that it is really remarkable that India has achieved And that kind of an achievement, and I'm saying this, that kind of an achievement is not possible but for your participation. Just remarkable. Now, it can't be left at that. You have a larger agenda for the Amrit Kal. The larger agenda for the Amrit Kal is now just don't stop at this. Inclusion now has to be at a different level, a layer more. One layer more, two layer more. Digital university that PM spoke about. Digital banking that PM spoke about. Digitally provided hospitals that all of us want so that we are able to benefit from better health facilities for our own people Today, Ayushman Bharat is a five lakh insurance for a family which can go to a hospital and get treatment. So what, you would say. But the point about that is that treatment is going to be available for him in a paperless fashion. He doesn't have to fill his name, address, village, what is his ailment, none of it. Digitally, his medical record is being provided and also, he doesn't have to show his identity or he doesn't have to do the paperwork, but he doesn't have to pay in cash either. It, would you think it was possible in, in India, even 20, 30 years ago? You go anywhere, there are empaneled hospitals, get your treatment under Ayushman Bharat, no paperwork, no cash payment. I think it is just that which is a classic example of what you can do for inclusion using technology. Now, you know, on a different scale and an, on a different purpose, finance ministry in India has benefited immensely. And how does it uh, benefit immensely? the faceless system of assessing a taxpayer, a faceless way in which you could engage with him without that random one-off official, and I'm, I'm being careful here, random one-off official who could be a black sheep in the system seeking rent out of that transaction, claiming that, oh, you have not complied with the law, so None of that is now possible because of technology. So assessment is actually India deserves to be appreciated for that. No rent seeking anymore because of technology. So assessment is done using technology. 
engagement post assessment where you have a problem you say no this is not right assessment i have a quarrel with you you can quarrel using emails or any other mode of electronic communication and post that adjudication also happens in a faceless manner some officer sitting somewhere who centrally given this message handles it and he doesn't have to face the ssc or the ssc doesn't have to go and approach him and then the verdict is given that's the end of the story post that that matter is not opened again and that is not a mean achievement for a country and i can say this with authority and confidence a country in 2014 threw only this challenge at me saying tax terrorism oh you finance minister tax terrorism what are you going to do about it we are harassed now leave me do any one of you all see that in any paper nowadays is there any question of tax terrorism anywhere no we, sh we can still have ways in which the system can be improved but no terrorism here so i'm giving you one or the other example to prove how india has rapidly and exhaustively almost near exhaustively changed itself for the better and the only magic wand there is technology and one of the things which i did say to the us treasury secretary yesterday is the benefit of having brought in technology the benefit of having used dbt has actually saved india the public exchequer in india 2 lakh crores of taxpayers money which was otherwise getting pilfered that plugging has happened because of solutions that you have given using technology that plugging of loopholes has happened because of the kind of solutions using technology you have given this country nearly 2 lakhs is not a small number for a treasury which has increasing demands to meet with fundamental provision of infrastructure or fundamental assistance or hand-holding for the poorest of the poor. And the middle class is also being served because of the way in which you are today removed from the physical harassment of many of these kind of doing these chores. So that's the India about which all of us will have to be thinking. But if we have to reach that level of, let us say, development by 2047, and I'm consciously equating you to the freedom fighters of India who fought for political freedom fighting. Political freedom we wanted from an alien or an outsider or a colonial master. But today, I'll refer to the speech of the Prime Minister, August 15, 2022, where he came up with those five panch pran, but one of which is very important. And here, I'm purposely drawing on that because we have to now trust ourselves and have that confidence in ourselves that we are setting the benchmark for the world on many things. There was a time, there was a time we kept repeating, and probably even today we keep, keep repeating, global standards. I can tell you with confidence today, for all the achievements you startups have done, and for all that which is happening in this country, unabated, one or the other, you know, solutions for problems which are really bogging the governance down, not just in India, in many other places as well. India is setting the standard. The global benchmarks have been seen being achieved in India 
during the pandemic, immediately after the pandemic. And that is not easy. So that today should indicate the level of confidence we should have. The scale of what India has achieved through the digital revolution, the India stack, are all not achievable elsewhere. At least till now, we have not seen it achieved elsewhere. So that is something which I think we need to capitalize on. We need to leverage that. We have set the standards. Even advanced economies could not reach its own people. Technology they didn't have in their hand to reach citizens at their doorstep. You showed the way. So India today sets standards, whether it is finding a vaccine for the COVID-19 pandemic during the pandemic, and whether today that we were able to reach every citizen who needs not just one dose, second dose, and even a booster dose. Many countries are still waiting to go and reach their citizens. So scaling up doesn't frighten us. We know how to prudentially use cost. We give solutions for our problems. We don't any more wait for patents to come from outside. The vaccine is a classic case in that point. In space technology, we don't wait for anybody else. They are seeking our technology or assistance. So I can go on, on like this. But broadly, the world is in your hands now. You're really holding the world. And when I show this image, my mind immediately goes to talking about the G20 logo which the Prime Minister launched. And what is that logo? It, will, it is the image of a lotus which is in tricolor, holding up the earth, which has a blue tinge. And the tricolor lotus with seven petals, seven petals denoting the seven continents, seven seas, And that is given that shape and that kind of a imagery because India looks upon the world as one earth where all of us live. We are one family and the future is in our hands. And what better words speak about it? Vasudeva Kutumpagam, which is ancient for India. And therefore, a knowledge-based society that we want to build requires skills, and that has to be spread through digital means. Physically taking skill training to one and all is going to be difficult, but still, that would also happen, but through digital, we need to train, we need to educate, give access to education, and so on. So I'm sure whether it is G20, which is going to happen through the next year, and I'm sure for the Amritkal reaching India at 100, solutions are going to come from you. Affordable, scalable solutions are com coming from you. And this engagement, is absolutely critical and it should keep happening periodically. So thank you, your story, for giving me this chance to talk before this wonderful audience. And all the very best for all of you. You know, ma'am, if I have to tell you this, and all of you, all of us are entrepreneurs in this room, I have to say 
something, it is a very emotional moment and I want to go on record to say this. One is that, two things I want to say. One is that I had the privilege and opportunity of interacting with you a couple of times during the pandemic. And at one conversation you had lost your voice because you hadn't slept for many, many days and I saw the relentlessness with which you were committed. You were just standing and, 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 and to me that was an inspiration. And second, which I want to say to everyone, that, you know, today is a very emotional moment for me because uh, I can't, you know, like all of us, I also come from Bihar in a very, from a very normal background. I don't have any big backing or anything like that. And to me, the biggest change this government has done that a normal event, if it is standing with entrepreneurs and if it is supporting startups, then they are walking the talk. Today she comes to this event. To me, it is the biggest, biggest thing, right? Because I'm not even an industry body or I'm nothing, right? And if this can happen, what the government is showing that it can happen to each one of us. We all can be sitting and ma'am, it is a great, great honor. And I'm a huge fan of what you've done and especially in the last uh, few years. With that, uh, one request I have for all of you, because I'm also very nervous, uh, is that she had such an amazing, genuine speech that, and, and such a powerful conversation came straight from the airport without coffee and I just don't want to hold her longer. Is that we can stand up and give a standing ovation for that speech? Ma'am, very quickly, one is that, you know, when it comes to technology and what the government has done, one amazing thing is that someone outside, someone sitting in this room, we have democratized uh, access, decentralized technology, which has actually created a very equal playground for everyone. Today, it doesn't seem like because UPI and you know different technologies it's accessible for everyone I want to ask you and and the government has done such tremendous and work and talk walk the talk I want to ask you today that as the government what are some of the things on your agenda to further technology and to bring this kind of inclusivity which we can't see anywhere in the world Right, the way India has uh, leveraged and leapfrogged the technology. What are some of the things uh, that are on your agenda to further technology? And what are some of the things that you would see, say, to all of us as uh, Indians that we should keep our eyes on? Well, I think somewhat uh, I did indicate even as I spoke, government is committed to ensure that the digital framework and technology-based solutions, as much as comes from the government, will be a public good. It will be available for everybody to use. Regulators are constantly talking to each other. And we, from the ministry also, engage with the regulators to make sure that options through sandbox trials are given so that every innovative solution or would-be solution can be tested. So there is no way in which people are going to wonder, how do I now make it applicable in such a way that regulators wouldn't have a problem? So the constant keeping ahead of the curve by the uh, uh, regulators is something on which I'm placing a lot of emphasis, because it shouldn't be that the uh, solutions are coming from the startups, but the regulators are spending time understanding it. It has to happen simultaneously. It has to happen rapidly. So the commitment to engage with technology and solutions which have to be IoT or uh, intelligence-based or machine learning-based will all have to happen. So that dedication and policy stability which we like to offer are there. It will continue to be there. And that, I think, will make a big difference for the startups. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, you know, in uh, the traditional Indian philosophy, there is uh, this saying, Swa Dharma and Swa Bhava, which is uh, that uh, there are some things that you want to do 
for the good of everyone and there are some things that you want to you believe and then you want to personally do uh, you know when you at your place and the where we are and where we have continued to you know grow and stay in the last two years when you have to take the decision between welfare and budgetary discipline when you have to take uh, you know a very inclusive decision at the same time uh, ensure that we are you know prudent and frugal how do you go about taking those decisions is there any thumb rule that you follow not really um, yes there is an element of balancing that you have to do but if you're talking about fundamental necessities which have to reach every indian and particularly those who have been denied it for a very long time consciously or unconsciously denied they cannot be any more waiting on that i think i'm very grateful that the prime minister very clearly gives you that um, his peace of mind in saying how how long more do you expect the fellow to wait without a toilet in his house how long more do you expect women to be cooking with you know firewood these are the kind of things on which they cannot be any more waiting so it's not a, just a question of balancing resources it's also balancing that principle do you want india to wait for fundamentals yeah. do you want india any indian to wait for even the basics but equally do you want indians to think that every rupee paid as a tax doesn't get him anything in return because people don't value that one rupee so it's a balance between these two the value for a taxpayer's money use it productively so that everything can have a multiplier sooner you achieve the goals that you want to that's the balance that we try to do not because i have only a thousand rupees i can't give houses no that's not the kind of balance ma'am uh, prime minister this year uh, during the independence day you know he called out that startups are the nation builders and they will go to define the destiny of the country and since 2014 he was the first one to go and say startup india to abhi ghar ghar mein ab log sochte hain ki engineer doctor ke alawa you can uh, become a startup is a, a, an option i want to ask you today what would you like to tell all the startups and particularly what are the kind of startups that you would like us to build and what are some of the opportunities that you would like all the young entrepreneurs in the room to think about i don't think i have anything to say you proved yourself in the last 2 3 years so much that now you will have to also be clear on how you want your path laid for the next 20 25 years what are the areas in which you have to move although since you vast i'll take this liberty to say can i have more women in this room <laughs> that's the kind of support you know i want startups to do well chalk their course take it forward tell us new things for the government to take as a matter of policy decision all that but for every let's say three ideas that you put across tell me also one idea to say how to bring more women to be in the startup ecosystem thank you thank you so much for calling it out because uh, i hope that this conversation and what you are saying leads to a trigger a thought and a change ma'am uh, we've been asking a lot of entrepreneurs over the last two days on how do they and I, i if i may have the liberty of asking you this question is that how do you spend your day we talk to successful entrepreneurs investors and ask them how do you go about your day and whatever i saw of last two years i just saw you constantly uh, working just want to get a sense from you how do you spend your day no constantly working is not me constantly working is a pm <laughs> and i'm sure no one will have a disagreement on that um well i do give myself some time for myself in the sense of to listen to some music read some book or talk to people who can be you know motivational to me who i respect who with whom i share some kind of bond so i do all that 
<laughs> can we just ask what is that percentage of uh, music and everything else that um, you do? That's probably not the same every day. It depends on the day, it depends on the intensity of work. But travel is something which I'd never, in the sense flying is something which I never enjoyed because it's so drab, it takes a lot of time. And the, the routine that you have to do about, you know, going to an airport, check in, all that used to be something which I've never enjoyed. I loved train travels because it's a lot easier on you. <laughs> the demands are a lot less. You can stretch your feet, you can put up your whatever light and read. And the pace at which go, it goes also gives you a view through the window of the changing contours of India and all that. So train has been a very soothing experience, but I don't do much of it. So for the drab experience of flying, the big advantage is I have a good store of music and uh, I do plug my ear with the birds and listen to the music. And that's how I think I energize myself through the flight and get out to do meaningful things. And ma'am, I have to say on behalf of all of us, it's very, very special that you took the flight and from the airport straight came to this hall. Thank you so much. Uh, for us, for all of us in the country, and for hopefully all of us will go back and think that how do we actually not have this conversation, but you know, look and listen to your words that we have more women in the room. It is very, very encouraging that you are here and talking to us. But one minute there. Huh? I don't want anyone to have a misunderstanding that probably it's India and it is only in India this happens. Just incidentally, I didn't uh, come here to say this, but because the audience is a captive audience and I can get away by <laughs> speaking things. Um, US Treasury Secretary. She is somebody who's had the leadership role in three different top institutions of the US. The Fed, she headed, headed it. Before that, the Council of Economic Advisors, mm. she headed it. And now she heads the ministry, meaning the treasury. I got to know that her biography was released very recently in the US. Just managed to get a copy. There are two actually simultaneously released. Mm. And I only have managed to read some pages of both the books. And that is reading page after page. There are also some pages which are browsed. Clearly, the problem of women not, in, not finding equal space to operate is not an Indian problem. In that biography, I could find excerpts of various different, uh, whether it is university or working in the government or any other space. Several observations which do say women don't get that space. So let's not get discouraged by the fact that I've said it and think that, oh, it is only in India. Not at all. It seems to be a global matter. Yeah. But Indians, like the way we break many things, like the way we set examples on many things, can set example even in this. And ma'am, on behalf of everyone, I would say that you are an example to us, not just to the women, but to all of us, because you are so forthright, so candid, and so amazingly taking us. We all take pride in the number that we can say that we are the fifth largest economy in the world. And uh, when everywhere there is crisis, we've managed to stay true and we are growing. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you so much. And I would say that ek bar fir ut jate hain. she's come all the way just for all of us. Ma'am, thank you so much. Thanks a lot.